Hello, my name is Jessica Schechtel, and I am a wildlife welfare specialist with San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. I have responsibilities at our facility in downtown San Diego, as well as at our sister park, the Safari Park, which is about 45 minutes from downtown. I also work with our internal conservation projects on the island of Hawaii and San Clemente Island, as well as those right here in San Diego County. In addition, we have projects all over the world and partner with conservationists in Kenya and elsewhere. So my background obviously is in exotic animal welfare, um, but I think that what I'm going to present to you today will translate no matter what industry you are involved with. Um, it's Most of my examples obviously are going to be from the exotic animal realm, but I hope that each and one of every one of you can find a little bit of this that will benefit you and the animals you care for in some way. So to begin with, I wanted to start off with just a quick example of um, quick definition of what we are talking about when we're talking about animal welfare. This is the AZA's um, animal welfare definition. Basically, um, they have determined that animal welfare refers to an animal's collective physical, mental, and emotional states over a period of time, and it's measured on a continuum from good to poor. Um, so basically, you know, there's there's three different components. It matters um, as far as time and space where you're welfare state is, and your welfare can change on a continuum from good to poor, and that can be from hour to hour, day to day, or even minute to minute. The other important thing to remember is that welfare, as far as we're talking about these three different states of welfare, don't always have to be the same. So just because you have good physical welfare doesn't mean that your mental state is going to be at that same level, or your emotional state will be. Um, I know a lot of what we're really good at is diagnosing physical states because it's there are tangible, objective um, things that we can assess. Mental and emotional are a little bit harder. Um, there are some indicators, as I'm sure most of you know, in order to um, figure out where our animals are both mentally and emotionally. Um, most of those deal with motivation for animals to engage in specific behaviors um, or motivation for them to engage in things like luxury behaviors, things like play, um, can be indicative that their emotional state is in a good state of being because they have the luxury of exhibiting those behaviors as well. So when we're talking about welfare, we start a lot with inputs. We start with what inputs um, are we presenting to the animals we care for? So there's obviously enrichment, um, there's environment for another example, and of course, food. Those inputs drive outcomes. So for enrichment, the outcome could be the behavior of the animal. Environment, it could be the fitness, the physical fitness of the animal as far as what opportunities they have to exhibit um, muscle strength. And for food, it could be something like body condition. From those outcomes, when we put those all together, we for, start to formulate an animal's experience. Um, obviously, these aren't the only three inputs that happen in our animals' daily, weekly, monthly lives, but just as a core example of how everything must come together in order for us to um, really take a look at what's happening with the animal's experience. I want to just talk about enrichment real quick. Um, enrichment has almost become a, a dirty word um, for me just because it is so input heavy. When we talk about enrichment, we're talking about an item, we're talking about an object. Um, enrichment was a really good thing when, um, you know, it it became a standard 50, 60 years ago. That was back when our animals really didn't have much to do and enrichment was something extra. It was something that would ensure that at least the animals had some opportunity to exhibit um, physical or mental abilities that they had. But since then, enrichment has really become almost a check the box. We have to do enrichment today. I have to put something in with my animal in order to say I enrich the animal. Um, and so to me, we're coming at it from the opposite way. There's been, you know, there's been a big push to really look at enrichment from an outcome-based approach or a behavior-based approach. And so I like to, instead of talking about enrichment, 
really start to talk about experience. So again, taking all of those different inputs together in order to look at what's the experience of the animal. And enrichment might be one component of it, but enrichment is not the thing that makes our animals' lives or our animals' state of welfare go towards that good spectrum on that continuum that I showed you earlier. So when we take away enrichment, we have the complete experience. Um, so, you know, a lot of caretakers, this is, this is what we have. Um, we go to an enrichment shed or an enrichment shelf and we say, what objects do I have to give today? What sort of input can I give to my animal today? Um, but instead, what we really should be asking ourselves is what behavior do I want to promote today? So the difference between taking some plastic items, putting them in with the animal just to see what they would do is very different than strategically thinking about what are the physical and mental adaptations of an animal like this elephant in my example here that I can promote based on some of the inputs that I have. So um, you can see in this example here, he actually um, has to pull on the rope in order to gain access to that, that food source. And he has to grab, he has to hold on to it with his foot and grab again in order for it to come closer to him. So again, not only addressing his physical needs or his nutritional needs, but also starting to engage him cognitively, layering those challenges that we know our animals are so good at, at um, achieving. So when we start to look at outcomes, um, if we think of outcomes as behaviors, all of these varying outcomes are what should be driving the input. So um, as caretakers, when we can start to think of behavior as the thing um, that we need to give to our animals or we need to promote for the animals we care for, then it can start to inform the inputs. And again, outcomes can inform different inputs and different inputs might have different outcomes. And again, it's all, all a tangled um, web we weave. But when you put all those outcomes together, again, that's when we start building this really rich experience. And when we come at it from an outcome-based approach or a behavior-based approach, we come up with a more rich and complex and really um, species-specific appropriate challenges for the animals we care for, instead of coming from it just as, this is the enrichment that I have today, let's just see what they're gonna do with it. Um, so one thing to remember is presentation is everything. So again, the input, this is an example of a beef heart, but when we start to think about what are the physical adaptations that our animals have that allow them to, to be animals. This is Diego, he is an ocelot, um, and he's a geriatric ocelot. And, you know, different caretakers care for him and have different opinions of what should or should not be done. These big ropes were fairly new to his habitat in this video example. And um, the keepers were unsure if he would even climb on them. You can see he left his, his foot on for a second. Um, so he's not able to climb on top of it, but he's surely capable of keeping himself um, on the rope long enough in order to get to that food source. So presenting appropriate challenges and pushing our animals a little bit also becomes very important when we start to formulate the experience of the animals that we care for. Since then, um, Diego was a little over-conditioned in this example. He has um, lost a significant amount of weight. This is the dismount, my favorite part. Um, but you can see with the challenging our animals now, we not only allow him to have better physical health through musculature, um, but we also start to engage those core cognitive abilities that make him have to think in order to achieve some of these challenges. Um, so when we're building an animal's experience, these are all of the different, different things that we take in consideration. And all of these on their own are um, specific areas of research. And so as we continue to learn, we can start to pepper all of these things into the, the experience of the animals we care for. Um, looking at the animal's perspective, how is it different to be an armadillo versus a citizen or a parrot? How do they perceive the natural world differently? What are their primary sensory modalities that allow them to experience their world that maybe we're not always attuned with? Um, looking at natural and individual history becomes very important. 
um, choice and control has become a really hot topic. Um, looking at what are the what are the inputs that we're giving to our animals that's allowing them to make choices, um, which in turn is driving their perception of control over their own habitat. Uh, looking at honest and reliable signals. So what signals are we giving to the animals in order for them to know how to react to different situations? And are they reliable? Um, most of you, I'm sure if you've been at zoological facilities, if someone walks by with keys, a lot of times the, the animals will orient towards that sound because keys to them means something might happen. Um, if a keeper comes, they might shift me, they might feed me, they might not do anything at all. It might be a buildings and grounds staff member and nothing's going to happen. So making sure those signals are reliable can become really important in allowing our animals to be participants in their own daily life and relationship to the environment that they live in. Again, looking at their 24 hour experience. So our animals live here 24 hours a day, just because we're here eight and a half doesn't mean that what happens when we're not here um, can't inform husbandry decisions. The advent of technology of trail cams, DVR systems in order to really see what animals are doing overnight or even in the hours before we come in um, have all served to inform different husbandry practices. Human animal relationship or stockmanship um, has gotten a lot of attention as well. So the our interactions with the animals, are they deterring um, the animal's experience or are they promoting the experience of the animal? Lighting and soundscape, is there construction? Are there lights that are on? Um, maybe when they shouldn't be, are these animals nocturnal and they need to be in a darker place? Looking at cognitive challenge, this is one of our favorite ones to look at. Predictability, are we being predictable enough without being predictable all of the time? And then of course, looking at how we present these inputs both temporally and spatially becomes very important as well. One of the tools we use in order to build experience is something that we call a behavior-based workflow. And this really has become the core tool that we use to build the experiences of the animal. And it's, it's very simple and complex and adaptable at the same time. So we start with a species, we ask um, for any behavior that this species might exhibit both in the wild, um, informed by natural history. And then we take those behaviors and break them down into context and components. So what are the various contexts or components of one very specific behavior? Next, we start to look at natural history adaptations. What is it physically or cognitively that allows the animal to perform these behaviors in this specific context? And then outcomes. What would you expect to see if we were successful at eliciting this behavior? And these are the real objective outcomes that we're looking for, whether it's increased fecal output, increased body condition, um, decreased stereotypies, all of those things that we can objectively collect in order to determine if our animals are exhibiting the behavior, even if we can't see it. And then the very last thing we look at it are the inputs. How can we provide for these animals to elicit this behavior? What are the objects that we need? So putting inputs at the end instead of at the beginning allows us really to think about the animal first instead of thinking about the object first. Here's a quick example of one behavior-based workflow. This was um, done for yellow-footed rock wallabies. And when we were listing out the behaviors that they could exhibit, one person said drinking, which obviously most of our animals drink in some way. And we started diving into it and thinking, this is really a complex behavior that we don't always take the time to think about. Animals in the wild can drink rainwater, running water out of a body of water the moisture off of vegetation, or in colder environments from melting snow or ice. And if you think about the way that an animal's body has to position themselves to drink out of a running water source, which could be a dangerous thing on its own, versus a shallow pool of water, you start to really open those gates in your mind and think about the different ways that, that we can elicit physical postures or cognitive challenges. And again, these all drive different inputs. Um, since then, we have done things like blocked off drinkers for our animals. So they have to work to get to their water, whether that's moving sticks or, um, or tipping a PVC over in order to get to the water. So this has opened up a floodgate, if you will, of um, different inputs that we can use in order to promote that welfare of our animals. 
Here's a couple of, of examples of just different ways animals might acquire water in the wild. Um, these are things that happen on a daily basis and it's something that we never really think about as caretakers because why would we make it challenging to get to water? All of our animals have to have a drinking source. It's in the guidelines, it's in our protocol. Um, but as long as they have the opportunity to get water and they're monitored, we've determined that um, having a little bit of challenge peppered in there or presenting water in different ways can be a really good source. Okay, so um, when we're talking about enriched experiences, other than using our kind of foundational behavioral-based workflow tool, we've broken down experiences into two main categories, and that's enriched husbandry and enriching events. So I'm going to go through enriched husbandry at this point. When we go through our outcome-based workflow, it sparks a lot of creative ideas, and some of them are super complex and might take weeks or months in order to implement, and some are really easy, and they're things that would be enriching if presented to the animal each and every day, whether it's changing um, service times or just changing the way we present items. And this is an example from a uh, red rough lemur. So we really wanted to get suspensory feeding from this, this animal because it's something that they would do in the wild. And it's something that has always been a challenge for our keepers. And we came up with making these pans. So these are just reptile rock dishes that we put some rebar on and made a, a suspended food dish. And you can see in this video, it successfully elicited the behavior that we were after. So these food dishes now um, have become part of standard husbandry, not only for our red rough lemur, but for other animals that we would expect to see feeding arborally, like hyrax or marmoset. And so these have become really a, a foundation for us for these arboreal animals that have come out of that behavior-based workflow. Here's another example. This is an I.I., a very, very specialized primate um, found only on the island of Madagascar. They have a long finger that they use to tap on wood in order to hear if it's hollow, indicating that there may be insects present. And if they do hear that it's hollow, then they'll use these large incisors to chew into that source in order to obtain the insects. When we um, brought them into our collection uh, about five years ago at this point, we got a lot of information from Duke Lemur Center on how they fed their, their I.I. because we knew it was very important for their incisor health to allow them to chew and present their food in that way. Um, and so we took what Duke had done and we built on it. We have an awesome volunteer staff and you can see this rack on the left are all of the different ways that we are able to elicit that behavior from a, a muffin pan with a plywood over it that they have to tap in order to hear where to chew, to cardboard tubes, to bamboo tubes. And really what I wanna get across here is that none of this is extra. So this isn't the enrichment rack. This isn't, you can feed them like this if you want to, if you have time. When new keepers are brought in, this is the way that we present the food to the I.I. There's no reason not to. There's no question about it. These are your different options when you're putting food in with the I.I. It's never an option to present food in a metal dish. And I think so often um, we lose sense of this kind of putting the animal first. It's not the caretaker's choice whether they want to do it or not, but it's really coming together with those caretakers, looking at the behaviors you want to exhibit, and then allowing them to be part of the process and passing that knowledge on. So when that new keeper trains a keeper in five years, they're also told, this is the way we do it. And hopefully maybe we've expanded on that by then as well. Another example of enriched husbandry is, is um, from our very first project, uh, Replace the Pace, which involved our snow leopards and our Amor leopards. Here at the zoo, um, diets are delivered every day. So um, we have a very large animal collection. Our forage warehouse is very busy. And to keep it consistent and clear, most items have a specific delivery date. So Sunday is always bunny day. Bones come on Monday, maybe um, Nebraska carnivore meat comes on Tuesday, maybe bones are on Thursday again, but all of our animals have been on a, a weekly schedule of when diet items are presented. And when we started going through the workflow and looking at all these opportunities that we wanted to present to these animals, we realized very quickly that one thing that was inhi inhibiting our progress was 
the delivery of the diet. We wanted to feed a bunch of food on one day and then have a fast day and then maybe give that really novel item the next day. So we came together with nutrition and veterinary services in our forage warehouse and really spelled out all of the benefits of changing the feeding strategy from increased musculature to increased cognitive abilities. And through the donation of a very generous donor, we were able to get our own freezer and fridge that resides now at the Amor Leopard Habitat. And now they are delivered two weeks of diet at a time. So that two weeks of diet comes, it's stored in the freezer. They've been properly trained how to thaw the meat product out. And now they can change it up. Sunday doesn't have to be bunny day. Tuesday could be bunny day. And that means that it's not always Megan feeding out the bunny. Sometimes it's Todd feeding out the bunny. And he has different novel ideas and different things that he wants to do. Um, it also allows us the ability when we know something's going to be going on. So maybe we know it's going to be a particularly busy day or there's going to be a medical procedure and keepers can respond to that with the food. So again, just an example of very easy husbandry changes um, that are enriching to the core husbandry of the animal. Um, another example came from a couple of keepers who had the opportunity to travel to Kenya. Uh, these keepers came back with lots of stories and photos and they realized that giraffes don't always feed up high, like on this picture on, on the left-hand side here. Um, this is the way that giraffes are always kind of iconic, like shown as feeding, right? With that neck really upstretched. But what we discovered was they often feed at mid heights and also at low heights. And if you think about the complexity of the different plants that are found at those different levels at the different times of year, the seasonality that might go into that, we've determined that, again, this is a really easy opportunity for us to enrich the husbandry of these animals that we care for. So now um, through our working group here at the zoo, we have begun to feed our giraffe at varying heights. And it seems so simple. And it seems like, why didn't we ever do this before? But sometimes it really takes taking a close look at the, the animal, taking a minute to come together and really think about the natural history and what could they be doing that we're not seeing here in our own facility. Um, and so it's been really rewarding and very enriching for both the giraffe and the giraffe keepers thinking about the different ways that we can present food. Um, and, you know, you, we see very different behaviors from them than we did when we always presented the brows up high on the palapas. Okay, so the second half of experiences are um, talking about enriched events. So enriched events came out of the workflows because we came up with a list of inputs. Remember at the end, you come up with kind of a, a list of inputs based on the behavior that you want. And what we realized was we wanted to start to layer those inputs and we wanted to give cues to our animals. Um, with our grizzly bears, we realized seasonality is super important. So changing their diet throughout the year, the way we present their food, the way their habitat looks, can we put in a bunch of plants when it should be spring and lush and maybe take them out in the winter when it's not? Remember, we are in San Diego, so we don't have the same seasons as, as a lot of other places. Sometimes we have to make our own seasons. But it, it really made us think about what are the cues we're giving to these animals and can we make the inputs meaningful and ask them to make choices that are meaningful to them? So let me give you an example of one enriched event. Um, this is a serval and we wanted to um, kind of play off the idea of in the wild when it rains, insects often come out after the rain and when the insects come out, birds might come out in order to hunt the insects, and that might be a really good opportunity for a serval to catch a bird. Um, so very often in the presentations that we give, we talk about how servals are amazing. They can jump 10 feet straight up in the air to catch a bird out of mid-flight. Have we ever done that with our servals? No, only opportunistically if a native bird flew into the habitat. But it's always been very challenging because we don't feed out any, um, any avian items to our animals here. And if we did, how would we be able to present that same layering of seasonal cues? Well, we came up with an idea of how to do it. So instead of rain, which doesn't rain here very often, we turned on the misters, we hosed down the habitat, and we did it for more than just 
five minutes. We made it really wet. Like there was a torrential um, rain that had happened. And when that rain ended, the insects came out. We have some live crickets that we would release into the habitat. The servals might chase them around and, and eat the crickets. And then maybe the next day, that would be when the bird would show up. So we're back to this point of not having a bird. So we're thinking about what do we have? And what we have are shank bones, which we give to our servals. So how can we make the shank bone bone a bird? And if you think back to that list that I showed you before, we had to remember, it's not about it being a bird. It's about seeing the same behaviors that we would expect to see elicited if she were to catch a bird. And that's jumping, acquiring, and processing. And so what we decided we would do is take the shank bone and make it a bird. The penguins just happened to be molting at that time. So we took the real downy feathers that came from the penguin habitat and mushed them up to the, um, to the shank bone in order to make a shank bird. And then we hung it up high. So when the servals were um, let back into the habitat, they went over, they had to jump straight up into the air, a couple of failed attempts in order to acquire that bird. And then the best thing was they had to process it. So they still had to take those feathers off and rip them off and in order to get to their bone. I don't know um, if they were really thrilled at the, in order to do that, but it did elicit that behavior that we were looking for. And again, looking at how can we promote their physical skills along with their mental and emotional skills at the same time. Another example is from our tiger working group. So um, we, one of the ways we try to increase the welfare of the animals that we care for is to come together as groups where we invite everyone from uh, caretakers, obviously, to applied animal welfare staff, to nutritionists, veterinarians, curators, and we come together and really focus on for that 45 minutes, the animal that we are talking about and focus on not only not just a string meeting or not just a meeting about what needs to be done, but really talking about behaviors that are possible and um, things that would be really valuable to the animals that we care for. So when we were in one of these meetings with the tiger team, um, we were talking about, they also take care of the taper, which are right next door. And we were talking about, wouldn't it be so cool if we could let the taper into the tiger habitat when they weren't there, of course, and let them forage around and then have them come out and then have the tigers come out and smell where the taper had been. It'd be enriching for the tigers and the taper. And one of the keepers said, yeah, you know, that's, that's a great idea, but tapers don't mean anything to the tigers because we smell like taper all the time. We've put taper urine in their habitat before and they're really not interested at all. And instead of just shutting down and saying, okay, that was a silly idea, we really took it on as a challenge. We said, okay, if taper scent doesn't mean anything to them, let's make it meaningful. Let's make taper scent a reliable and meaningful cue. And so we just so happened had the opportunity to um, present the tigers with a lamb carcass, no hide, no head, uh, fully eviscerated, but it was an item that they don't normally get. And so we're gonna make this lamb carcass into a taper using a multi-day approach. And so what we did was on day one, we used taper foot molds, which we just so happened to have because one of our tapers needed to have a booty fashioned for his foot. And we made footprints throughout the habitat and put some urine tape, put some urine from the taper in those footprints as if a taper had been in the habitat and maybe taken a specific path. The next day we did the same thing. It was a different path and we broke some branches, put some more urine in the plant. So building on this experience that start, starting to get the tigers engaged and thinking, huh, there might be a taper somewhere in my territory. I haven't had a chance to acquire it yet, but I know it's here somewhere. Day three, we have this vulture kite. And this came out of thinking about how would tigers know where potential prey were? And we were thinking maybe they would cue into scavengers in order to go and steal or snag a carcass from the scavengers. So day three, we put up this bird kite in order uh, as a visual cue that there might be an opportunity to acquire a food resource. 
And then on day four, um, the keepers were very vigilant. They even got the funk grease buildup, you can see from this photo, um, off of the tapers and really slathered it all over the lamb carcass in order to make it smell like a taper. And they attached it to this raft because we not only wanted them to associate taper scent with the lamb carcass, but we wanted it to them to exhibit the behaviors of having to stock and acquire a taper that might be in a water resource. So I'm gonna show you the video of what happened. This was actually a different experience. So it's not on the raft, but it's the same idea. The carcass is floating in the water on half of the boomer ball. This is Chinta. He's one of our um, brothers that we have here. They're sometimes housed together, sometimes housed separately. But you can see, he's. you can almost see his wheels turning as he's going to acquire this carcass. So he has to get in the water. He has to figure out his approach. Which way should he come upon it? How is it gonna move in relationship to the way he's moving? And this was something that really we never had the opportunity to do before. It was a hard behavior for us to, to get. And you can see how violent it gets. He's really killing that taper right now. At one point, I think he actually goes underwater, um, which is something that I don't know that he's ever done in order to, to acquire a food resource. Potentially, um, he's been underwater for some other reason, but not often. But these are all the behaviors we wanted from stalking to pouncing to struggling, fighting with the prey in order to to get to it. That's where he goes totally underwater. And then the end bit, you can see he's gonna finally get it after many attempts. And this is great, right? Because he didn't just get on the first attempt. Even though it's only been a couple minutes, it's longer than it could have been. You can see he has the kill bite, obviously the wrong part of the body but he's got the kill bite. And then once he's done killing it, he has to take a breath. He's, he's exhausted. That's probably the, the most fight he's ever had for acquiring a prey item. Um, so, so we have this beautiful suite of behaviors that's come from really thinking about the whole experience and not just let's put a carcass in and see what he does with it. And this becomes really important when we talk about some of our conservation projects. So this is an alala or a Hawaiian crow. They are extinct in the wild. And we have a program on Hawaii and Maui who have several alala in managed care. And the hope is that we will one day be able to reintroduce them to their native habitat on the island of Hawaii. And when we're talking about animals that are gonna be released for conservation projects, you really start to realize how important it is for them to read the cues from their environment. So they need to know when foods are ripened, where they might be able to acquire that food resource, what cues are associated maybe with potential predators or conspecifics. So we went through this process with, with our team out there and we decided we wanted to start to teach them about the various stages of how plants might develop. So first of all, we just put a potted plant in and then maybe flowers on the plant in order for them to determine that maybe there's gonna be a possibility for fruit in the future. Insects maybe came to pollinate the flowers and then the fruit appear. Um, so again, it seems, it seems a little silly to think about doing all of this, but when you think about the ramifications of the skills that we can be teaching to our animals, not only to be in a better state of welfare in the managed care where they are now, but the potential for them to be learning these skills, to have that cognitive switch turned on, so when they are released into the wild, that they're able to meet these challenges, they're resilient, and they can start to read these, these cues in their environment. Um, one important thing I do want to mention is that this 
idea of experience for the animal, whether it's enriched husbandry, enriched events, or looking at it as a whole, is something that happens their entire life. I think we so often kind of chop up an animal's life based on when we are involved in their life, whether it's from a medical perspective, maybe there's something going on for three months and then we don't see them again for two more years, or if it's from a caretaking perspective where all of a sudden we're taking care of a, a 10 year old animal and we see them from 10 on or midlife. But we're really starting to realize that it's the entire life cycle of this animal that matters. And how can we best provide them with the inputs that they need in the life stage that we are present in their life? So we have a couple of young Amor leopard cubs. As I mentioned, they were the first um, group that we started this process with. We've had two rounds of cubs and it's really evident to us how resilient they are based or versus some of the hand-raised cubs that we've had in the past. Hand-raised um, at other facilities are here for various reasons and their ability to need a challenge in order to not give up, to have those cognitive switches turned on, anecdotally at least, um, is very apparent to us. And so we're hoping that as we're building these programs, especially with the younger animals, we're able to lay that foundation when we know it's so important to learn these cognitive and behavioral skills that as they get older and have to meet challenges, maybe switching facilities, switching habitats, um, being introduced to conspecifics, being taken out of social groups, that they're resilient enough and confident enough that they can meet these challenges on their own. I just want to end with one last example. This is probably the most complex um, situation that we've ever been involved in really flushing out management strategies and increasing welfare states for animals. So this is our now three-year-old uh, penguin, shark, and multiple small fish habitat that we have as part of our Africa rocks. Um, newer construction here at the zoo. And, you know, it's not common for penguins and sharks and fish to all be housed together. You would think the, the sharks would be the ones causing the problem, but these are bottom feeder sharks. So um, even though it looks like the shark is pursuing the penguin in this photo, that, that is not what happens. Um, instead, what happens is the penguins who are notorious jerks, um, have been pursuing the fish and the sharks to the point where the sharks and fish have injuries that are severe enough that they have to be pulled off habitat to a behind the scenes area where they um, can be, be looked at and hopefully restored to full physical health. And we, we got a welfare concern about the, the state of these sharks and fish because it was happening frequently enough that there was just a continuous rotation of animals that were injured, presumably by the penguins. To be fair, um, the amount of times that we actually saw penguins pursuing fish and shark are very rare. A lot of this really comes from detective work, knowing that there's really nothing else that could cause these injuries other than that large um, sharp penguin beak. And so what we decided to do, of course, we couldn't just say, okay, take the penguins out or take the sharks out or take the fish out because we had no other place to hold them. Um, unlike maybe some of our terrestrial mammals, we might be able to make a space for them somewhere else to separate them. This really is a true mixed species habitat that there just were no other options within our facility. So we came together as a group and this group was more complex than normal because we had um, the keepers who took care of the penguins and then also the keepers who took care of the shark and the fish because they're two, two different sets of keepers, two different teams with different management, different management strategies. So 
in addition to this welfare concern happening, we now have um, kind of this miscommunication in what's going on. You know, we really didn't want to be like, your animals are causing trauma to my animals. And so coming together as a team, we were able to talk about what's truly happening. In addition to keepers, we had our veterinarians come, our nutritionists, curators, behaviorists. Um, we even had some of our conservation partners come who have um, experience with mixed species habitats. And we worked through all of the issues. And we started with a behavior workflow, thinking about what behaviors can we promote in the penguins that would allow them to stop pursuing the sharks and the fish? Because, you know, it's, it's pretty apparent they were pursuing the sharks and the fish not to eat them, but because they, they were curious about them. They instinctively moved towards these other moving shiny objects because they didn't get fed live fish. They got fed fish from someone's hand because that's how the malarial meds needed to be delivered. And so we went through the outcome-based workflow and one of the things that came up was being able to feed them live fish, live shiner fish, which is something we do for some of our other animals. And a lot of roadblocks were thrown up because the potential for those feeder fish to bring pathogens to the fish within our own aquarium um, would be a risk. Um, the penguins might not have the skills in order to catch the fish and then what might happen? The fish and shark in the habitat might overeat if we gave them too many shiners and the penguins didn't catch them. So just layer upon layer of roadblocks. And the great thing is we had um, Eventually, we had the right manager there to say, wait a second, let's just dial this back a little bit and think about what's really important here. We're looking at the behaviors of the penguins. We can do this in an off habitat area for the penguins. Let's just see if they're capable of catching the fish. And so by her taking down that roadblock, we were already one step further than we were. They did the trials in the back. Sure enough, the penguins were able to catch the live shiner fish like I knew they would. And all of a sudden, the keepers are realizing, the caretakers are realizing that these animals are really capable of, of things that they've never been able to do before, that they've never learned before. And so we keep going through the workflow and we find other opportunities, such as nest building. Um, the keepers find a specific grass, a, they dry it, they cut it up into very specific lengths and that's the nesting material that is provided to the penguins. Um, because if it's the wrong kind of grass, there can be mold or fungus that grows on the inside tube of the, the grass as it dries. And then of course you wouldn't want that in a nest, especially with um, young fledglings. So they're already roadblocked by all of these things that have just traditionally been done. But when we're looking at penguin behavior, we realized they have this huge suite of collecting nesting behaviors where they have to climb up on rocks, find the little scraggly patches of plants, rip them out violently sometimes, bring them back to their nesting site and process it. And by just providing the nest for them, it was taking away their ability, their chance, their choice in where they wanted their nest, what they wanted their nest to be made out of. Um, so again, that was another really good opportunity to look at the practices that, that have been put in place. And I think that's something that's not uncommon in the animal care industry as a whole is, you know, we stick with things that work. We stick with them because it keeps the animal healthy, it keeps the animal safe. But sometimes if we don't push those boundaries, if we're not asking, can our animals do more? And why would that be beneficial for them? even if it takes us out of our comfort zone, I think it's really important that we push each other in that respect and that we come together to really strategically think about how we can advance the care of whatever species of animal it is that we're, we're taking care of, whether it's a stick insect or a domestic dog or an elephant. Um, Presenting them with those challenges and not saying that good enough is good enough is really one of the cornerstones of our program and the reason why we're able to get to some of the results we have. Obviously, we don't always get, get great results, but it's a work in progress and we're at least working towards pushing all of our animals 
most days towards that good end of that continuum of animal welfare and constantly making sure they're not slipping backwards to the poor. So I just want to say thank you for staying with me this whole time. Um, I hope that some of what we've talked about today, as far as what we're doing with our program here at San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, could be applied to whatever it is you do in your practice. Um, it's been a lot of fun to see not only our animals thrive, but also our care staff um, being able to really come up with some creative, innovative husbandry strategies. So um, thank you again. And my contact information is at the bottom. I would love to hear from any of you. Thanks.